Today is National Foster Care Month. It's a time to put the spotlight on our community's foster children. Here to discuss more foster youths. Shane Harris, you were, and Vanessa Davis joining us now. Thank you so much for joining us today. Good to be here. So you both have had different, obviously, scenarios growing up in the foster system. Uh, let's start with you, Vanessa. If you want to explain what your experience was, what did you go through throughout your life <laughs> trying to find, you know, a consistent family? Yeah, um, I went into foster care at the age of three. My mom struggled with mental health challenges um, which are exasper exacerbated by drug um, issues and we didn't really have a lot of family support and so um, I went in at three I felt like it was only my family that was dealing with these type of challenges um, I didn't really realize that there were other people in the foster right. care system um, and I really just moved from home to home like every year I was in over 16 different placements I aged out at 18 each new home had to learn new rules, new ways. Wow. Um, yeah, and then aged out at 18 with very little resources. 16 different places. Mm -hmm. I mean, 16 different, you know, families to learn how to deal mm -hmm. with, I guess. Um, for you going through that, what, what did you gain from it? I mean, obviously you're able to deal with it. You're here today to talk mm -hmm. about it. Uh, so what, what came of that? Um, it's taken a long time for me to realize what I gained from it, but really I would say I gained survival skills. Mm -hmm. um, and there's a switch from when you go from living in survival mode to when you actually realize, you know, survival skills, but being able to adapt to different environments really quickly, mm -hmm. um, learn the lay of the land very quickly, yeah. discern people and their motives very quickly have all been things that have helped me wow. survive. Okay. Mm -hmm. uh, and Shane, obviously for your situation, different, right, than Vanessa's, but tell us what you went through in the foster youth system. Well, I went in when I was uh, eight years old okay. permanently, um, and I say permanently because my mother lost custody um, after a two-year uh, stint where she essentially did not go to the classes and the courses that are required of a parent to get a child back. Mm -hmm. uh, and so this was after my father died. And after the loss of both of my parents, essentially, they both ended up dying. I was in foster care for 13 mm -hmm. years, uh, went through about eight different placements, uh, foster homes and group homes combined. And, you know, went through a lot of uh, trauma and challenges uh, within the system. People don't understand. I mean, I think there's a statistic out there that talks about how foster youth uh, carry equivalent uh, trauma to the level of someone coming back from war. Wow. Um, yeah. So there is a serious uh, amount of uh, trauma that I went through, but I was able to overcome those things and, mm -hmm. and find a, a, a passion uh, that led me to now be able to be in a position to, to be a voice and, and, and sort of uh, put forth yeah. other, you know, former foster youth and foster youth on, on the platform to be heard. And, mm -hmm. and I think that both Vanessa and I have that in common, that, right. that there's an experience that we went through that we found strength in. Yeah. We turned pain into power. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I mean, obviously through no fault of your own, you're in this system, mm -hmm. and you hope that people are cared for, young children are cared for throughout all of it, uh, but that wasn't necessarily the case for either one of you, is that right? I mean, did you see that? Was it a, a nurturing environment, I guess, going through what you went through? <laughs> Honestly, it was a whirlwind. I was in yeah. so many different homes. Sometimes I'm like out and about and I'll have someone come up to me and they'll remember that I lived in their home and I have wow. no idea who they were. Okay. Um, I think one of the benefits for me is that one of my foster homes connected me to a church home, a mm -hmm. church family. And so even in the midst of the different transitions, I stayed connected to that church. I and see. that really is what helped me create like yeah. a solid foundation. Just to have people the church that you can count on. Yeah. Same thing for me, you yeah. know? Mm -hmm. And I think, um, you know, today, you see so many youth uh, who are coming behind us and both Vanessa and I are trying to, you know, really put a spotlight mm -hmm. on this. It's National Foster Care Month and in San Diego, we went from 7,000 foster youth uh, in 2010, around mm -hmm. 7,000 foster youth when I emancipated, to now we're at 2,500 foster youth. Okay. But we gotta remember over the last few years, mandated reporting has gone down because mm -hmm. of COVID. Oh, I see. Um, yeah. You know, and there's a number of other issues pertaining to this. As I talk a lot about disproportionality. Right. Uh, the 20% of uh, the 2,500 foster youth in the system are African-American children. Um, just about near 30% are Latino. Mm -hmm. So we have a lot of work to do, right, mm -hmm. to improve the system and to specific, specifically uh, help other foster youth be able to navigate and tell their stories and, and, and be able to ultimately make policy change mm -hmm. uh, on, on important levels so that we could really get to the nitty-gritty of 
why the system is working this way. I mean, we got to commend all the social workers and people right. who do do the right thing. Yeah. There are good people in the system. I right. don't want anybody to think that. Right. But there's a lot of work to make the system more equitable, mm -hmm. specifically for so many children of color who are disproportionately represented yeah. within the system. And I'm glad you're bringing that to light. I think so many people want to help, but they don't know how. Uh, and if the system has its own flaws, then there's no real help that's being given when you want to try to do your best. Uh, I, I apologize, I know this is a deep topic, but we are running out of time. Uh, is there a place people can go to if they want to help? What do you suggest? What can people do? Well, uh, people are welcome to uh, reach out to us at the People's Association of Justice Advocates. Uh, that's the nonprofit organization that I founded. We are the only national civil rights organization that has a specific focus on the child welfare okay. um, you know, area of expertise and specifically focused on improving those disproportionality right. numbers. And Vanessa's doing a number of things. People can go to www.pajmovement.org mm -hmm. um, and find more information out about what we're doing. And, okay. I, don't, and I don't know how yeah. folks want to. Yeah. <laughs> uh, and I brought something for you. This is What's a blue this? ribbon. Oh, okay. So, Thank you very uh, much. Folks could wear their blue ribbon this month. This mm -hmm. is National Foster Care Month. And you, you wear your ribbon to appreciate all the people who work hard in the system, yeah. as I talked about social workers and teachers and all of that. Uh, but then we also got to ensure that, that youth are heard this month, mm -hmm. right? Uh, yeah. There's still so much work to do. Uh, we are supporting a bill. I just came down from a meeting with the governor uh, mm -hmm. last week. Uh, we're supporting a bill AB 1794, which ensures that foster youth are r connected with their biological family okay. members when adopted. Okay. So it's really important, right, yeah. that a foster youth, even if they're adopted, they stay connected with their biological okay. family members. But okay. PAJMovement.org. Gotcha. Yeah. Thank you so much, Shane thank and you. Vanessa. Thank you for being here and sharing your thank story. You. We appreciate it.